906 Outdoors is brought to you in part by Crist, your Northwoods neighborhood store. It's late March and we're in the middle of an early spring, but if you go far enough north, you can still find enough snow for dog sledding. I met with the Mushing Club at Michigan Tech. We found out that it was um, the only collegiate mushing organization in the nation and perhaps in the entire world. And a look at shed hunting. Looks like an older one and a newer one right there. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. I know Six Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. I traveled north toward the Keweenaw to the town of Tapiola. That's where you'll find Otter River sled dogs. But I didn't go there just for some dog sledding. I went to meet with some Michigan Tech students who are part of a group known as the Mushing Club at Michigan Tech. The only known collegiate mushing organization in the entire country and possibly the world. And yes, it's right here in the UP. The club started about three years ago. Uh, with a fellow that had a dream about mushing and uh, created sort of an internship program with Tom and Sally. Basically, Otter River Sled Dogs is hosting the mushing club for Michigan Tech. And uh, a young man came to me uh, about five, four years ago, five years ago, asked me if he could do an internship with me, wanted to be a musher. So we went through a internship where he learned how to care for the dogs and train the dogs and race the dogs. And then he went away on another internship for a couple years. When he came back, he wanted to run the Copper Dog 80. And when he came back after that, uh, running that race with a group of students following him around, he told me he wanted to start a club and share this with as many people as he could. And so the following year, he did all the paperwork, went to K-Day, got a whole list of about 60 people on an email list and uh, started the club. Uh, he partnered with a girl from Minnesota named Claire Hendricks and um, they got this club rolling and in our first year um, we got you know a bunch of kids involved a um, bunch of people on the sled for the first time i've been in this club from the start uh, uh, adam schmidt and claire hendricks were the start of the club and they taught us a lot about mushing in general along with tom um, they got us on our sleds the first time they were very attentive to um, making sure that us new people, you know, knew what we were doing and were educated and were knew how to take care of the dogs. We see dogs as pets a lot of times, and these are athletes, and you got to take care of them like athletes. But you also got to show them the love and the attention that any normal dog is going to have. It's like working with children. <laughs> it's great. Year two, Adam and Claire ended up graduating, and um, the club continued to grow. And year three, we're looking at about uh, 275 people on an emailing list with uh, 80 registered members on Michigan Tech's involvement link. Tom and Sally are some of the most genuine people I've ever met. Um, you know, there's, there's very few people on this earth that would be this inviting to let, you know, 30 plus students out to their house every single week and just open it up for them. You know, the doors are open. They tend to feed us a lot and we try and give back by uh, you know, doing a lot of kennel chores and stuff like that. And um, Tom has been mushing for, what, 30 years or something like that. And um, the stories and um, everything that he has are just incredible. And we've learned so much from him. And not just about mushing, about everything else too. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you in part by Blades Bait and Tackle, your year-round connection to fishing Beatty Knock. Dom and Sally are like our parents here at school. Honestly, they share so many things with us. If it's not Tom uh, telling us wonderful stories about, you know, being in Alaska on the on the glacier and giving tours, it's. Sally telling us about her farm animals and showing us the new ducks she got and it's just like it's like a family coming out here and it's it's grown into such like it makes you sad to like 
know that we got to graduate at some point. <laughs> <laughs> the racing program that we have, students come out to the kennel and it's somewhat of a friendly competition. And we combine that too with um, rookie mushers and experienced mushers and stuff like that. We like to get students in their first race and we also like to get uh, experienced mushers into bigger and longer races like that. Um, and so we pack the winter full of uh, races all across Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. That first year about 12 uh, students come out regularly uh, and uh, we had seven students that did their rookie races that first year. In the second year, we not only got seven rookies through races, but five of the previous seven rookies ran in races uh, like the uh, midnight run at the UP 200. And uh, now this year, the third year, we did go to two races and we got uh, four students through their uh, rookie races. We got three students uh, through a three-leg uh, race at the Bear Grease, the Bear Grease 120. And uh, we've uh, come out of this year with uh, a hardcore group of uh, 20 to 25 students that uh, call themselves mushers. And so it's really exciting to see uh, these young folks start out and keep working at it until they just consider themselves mushers and this is what they do other than schoolwork. It's, it's so calming to just, you know, you finish up your homework, come out here, take a sled out on the trails. And I love teaching new people too. So this year I've gotten a lot of new folks out and it's, it's so much fun to watch somebody get on a sled for the first time, just like they're so nervous and then they just pick it right up. One of the cool things uh, about the students is that there's actually only one youper that's uh, in the mushing club, uh, Stephen, but uh, we have Maddie from Las Vegas, grew up in the desert. We've got uh, Griff, Griffin, that uh, he grew up in Chicago. He's a, just an out and out city boy. I would have voted him as the least likely to survive. And uh, we've been slowly but surely turning him into kind of a youper. And uh, we've got kids from downstate, uh, inner city kids. We've got kids from out in the Gaylord, you know, uh, suburban area. And uh, so these kids hail from all over the place. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I can't think of one person that was actually into mushing before joining the club. Tech has a K-Day where they have all the clubs have, that have booths out and it was just a blank table with a sign-up sheet and Claire and Adam are there and Claire had her dog there and I was like, a dog? <laughs> I was like, let me sign up for that. So that's kind of how it started and then it slowly grew into this huge group of people that just really love coming out here. I got involved with the club last year, so this is my second year. Um, my dad saw an article about it, actually, so he's an MTU alumni and told me about it. So I was like, I got to try this out. So I found them at K-Day, which is just an event at Tech, um, where students can check out organizations. And they were easy to find. They had like two dogs there with them. So, you know, I went up and got to meet the dogs and was like, yeah, this sounds fun. So I started coming out regularly, um, helping with the chores, you know, scooping the poops, feeding, all that stuff. Um, and then once the snow came, you know, I got to get on a sled and I remember getting put on for the first time. Everybody else had like somebody riding the basket and they were like, no, just go by yourself. You'll do fine. You're natural. Like you, you do other winter sports like hockey. So you're good. And I was like, all right, let's do this. And they were right. I just picked it up naturally. I just, I didn't know where I was going. I just let the dogs pull me. They knew what they were doing. And you know, I ended up figuring it out. It was a ton of fun. So I was like, I got to get into this. Like, you know, try to, so I started getting on a sled as much as I could. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Race Driven, your source for premier power sports products. Tom and Sally are wonderful. Oh my god, I'm so grateful that they have you know supported this club and that like the founders of the club created this because none of this would be possible without them. Um, Sally, we refer to her a lot as our uh, mush mom. Uh, she's always, you know, making food. If I bring new people out and they're not wearing the right attire, she's always offering boots, gloves, jackets, socks, anything. She makes sure everybody's taken care of, is nice and warm, um, always teaching people the dog names. And Tom is really good about, you know, getting people on a sled. He's just, he's 
gives really good tips and feedback in a really positive and enthusiastic way, which I love. It makes it really easy to pick up. You know, everybody that's coming out here regularly to the kennel, you know, upwards of 25 to 30 people who are, you know, partaking in uh, kennel chores and running sled dogs and stuff every week. Um, you know, they're, they're putting in a ton of time and um, a lot of us will get our homework done early on, you know, before classes even start, do our classes so we can spend the whole night out here. And, uh, you know, the way we market it to students is if you want to run, um, you know, just come out, have fun, help with kennel chores, listen to Tom tell stories, um, you can do that. Uh, if you want to get more serious, run dogs, maybe find yourself running the Copper Dog 150 or the UP200, you can do that as well. Um, it's supposed to be educational, right? Uh, we, you know, in a normal sled dog setting, the way you would get into this is approach a kennel owner and you'd have to, you know, work your tail end off. Uh, a lot of persistence, dedication, patience, and stuff like that that goes into trying to get into mushing. And we definitely try and preserve those core qualities, all the while making it more accessible for students. It's not surprising to me to find that the first and only mushing club of this sort started and exists here in the Upper Peninsula. It's also not surprising to me that it's starting to spread, at least here in the UP. I talked with Abigail Marty about the club she started at NMU. It kind of first all started because I went to school in the UP because of a dog sled race called the UP 200 and um, I volunteered at that race and I became obsessed with it um, and that's one of the reasons where I started mushing. So I came up to NMU then. We had this really cool race like we should have a club and then I found out that Tech had a club. I contacted Tom and like the other mushers that were like in the club and everything and like a bunch of the college kids just so I could like figure out more about it and that's how we kind of started from there. We got around 30 people signed up and then eventually we have a membership officially of around 60 already. Basically our club's goals is to get new people into mushing, either running dogs here or getting experiences in other mushing areas. And so we want to get people of, into all aspects of mushing. There's so many different um, dog types and breeds and races. And that's what our goal is, is to just get people out there and trying the different dog sports that there are. found out that it was um, the only collegiate mushing organization in the nation and perhaps in the entire world. So uh, uh, that definitely enthused us and um, we had a lot of more students um, wanted to join because of that. We're looking to broaden our spectrum even more and, and get out and do some other stuff. Tom has uh, dreams of uh, taking the club up to Alaska. In our first and second years, uh, there was a group of students that actually went up to Alaska under the club's guidance and volunteered at the Iditarod sled dog race. You know, now we're kind of known as like the mushing school, so it's a pretty neat thing. They've got mushing classes at the University of Anchorage. It strikes me as kind of interesting. There's not one kennel in Alaska that will actually sponsor uh, a group of students that want to become mushers and I think it's really important for our sport to realize that uh, it's only going to continue if we can continue to interest young people in following in our footsteps um, uh, after we hang it up or get too old to do it. I really am excited to see all these young people get uh, involved with the sport um, in uh, training and racing and uh, they have uh, fallen in love with the uh, group of mushers that they've met at the races and I think the group of mushers that we hang out with at all these races have fallen in love with these students too. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works, home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. For most of us, when we're looking for antlers, it's fall and they're attached to a deer's head. But springtime is a great time to get out and look for the ones that got away. Oh, good girl. Let's go. Let's find some toys. Come on. Shed hunting is a sport that's growing by leaps and bounds these days. There are shed antler record books, shed expos, and more. You might think it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. 
But with a bit of planning and a little effort, you can certainly increase your odds, or at least narrow down which haystack to look in. See, there's another good trail here. Yeah. No ground hornets, no mosquitoes, no wood ticks, no poison ivy. I'm watching the runways here because I knew they were traveling here. Just the first part of the snow. It just gives me a little indication, but you can find them anywhere, you know. They're just looking for a nice place to lay down. We've been just crossing a, an area where you would never see deer, like in an open poplar. Pull up an antler. There's one right there. Are you going to fetch a toy for us? No, oh, not going to play right now, huh? But it's usually 50-50 between Ivy and I. My friends think I cheat because I use the dog, you know. I tell them I'm not a slouch either, you know. You like this toy? Huh? You like this toy? You want this toy? You want this toy? Huh? Been chewed on a little bit, huh? Some rodents been out here. Oh, good girls. Oh, good girls. Let's uh, let's take a little walk that way, and then we'll continue down through the grass. We might find the ha other half. Very seldom do I find two antlers that match. We've had days where we find all lefts. You know, an area like this you, doesn't look like a lot of traffic is in it. You just, you take a look at this kind of area because in the wintertime, with a little snow, this would have been a very comfortable spot to sit and watch this field from. Plus that thing's the bump antlers on. If I'm watching the travel areas and I'm looking for bed down areas, uh, there's something in these this grasses they need first part of the spring, so they're digging in them. So that would have been a bounce so that the antler will fall off. And, and just an easier area to see. I uh, worked for an insurance man who, who lived out west and they had the Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts were collecting antler, antlers from sheds from deer and, and elk and they were making furniture and stuff out of them and they were, it was a fundraiser for them. Well, this could be a fundraiser here too, you know. You see the nice little center pieces with the antlers, especially the large antlers. Once they've been chewed on maybe by a porcupine, they really add a lot of character, you know, for a, a centerpiece. And even an anti-hunter, the deer was never killed, so it's not that, you know, terrible thing, you know, like a couple of feathers or a deer antler. You know, it's just a nice part of living up here. This fellows from the game farm aren't gonna give up a Boone and Crockett, but something that, that's Boone and Crockett that got chewed on, all mossy, you could see that that could be a, a real centerpiece. I, I can see the deer have been in here, it's knocked down, so they've probably been bedding in here. They're probably watching the field, the activity quits in the house and they come out and feed in the evenings. Oh yeah, see what Ivy's got. Ivy! And of course, Ivy's a boot dog. She doesn't go very far. Ivy, looks like it, just like bird hunting. If you're not gonna pay attention to her, there's no sense bringing her along, you know? So that's part of the game. At least if, she, if we're not paying attention, she is. We tried to keep the antler him away from anything else that we did hunting wise that's why we use the word toy are you looking for toys are you looking for toys oh, okay now find me one I want a good one Ivy look what we got you walked right by these toys For right here. We're looking for a good one. He's an up and comer. Oh, look at a nice brow tine on him. Actually, with that base, I'd say it probably wasn't that young a deer, really. Maybe even a deer on his way down, you know. All right, let's see if we can find the other one. It might be laying right here. Oh, yeah, you like those. If I found one antler, especially a good antler, I'd like to always find a pair. But I, it generally doesn't run that way. Uh, generally, if, if we're, you know, I've had a number of days where we found six antlers, large antlers, and not a single pair. But I always make an effort when I am in an area where I find a good one to, to look for the pair. Because this, it could have been a bedded area. I, I have found both antlers. You can see the deer was probably laying right there and the antlers are laying right, like the deer was, just, they just fell off him while he was sleeping there. But yeah, 
when you get something like this, you know, we just walk on usually, but where we found this antler today, I'll make sure that we check this spot. I can see the squirrels have chewed on it a little teeny bit, but for some reason that buck liked that spot. So with it, if it has the same conditions next year, that's probably where he's gonna be laying again. Come on, Ivy, on task. Find us a good one. Generally, I gotta carry one because if we bump grouse, you gotta put her back on task. You know, looking for deer sheds in the, in the springtime is just as big a hoot as, as hunting deer. To, to, to find a real good shed or even a small shed, it, 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 it's, it's every bit as much fun as the hunt. And a little better, maybe because we got catch and release involved in this. There's two. Talk about a double. Looks like an older one and a newer one right there. Actually, this looks like the other half of our deer right there. See, a happy spot. Oh yeah, definitely last year's. Five feet apart. A little bit of chew on it from the Berkey Pine or rabbit. No, I don't think they're a match. Could be in relatives though. Six new and one old. I bet we could walk right through the same area again and come up with more antlers. We just walked by them. Feel free to join us on Facebook or visit us at 906outdoors.com. And while you're there, be sure to sign up to get on the 906 Outdoors email list. We'll send you an occasional email with tips, recipes, and more. You'll also be eligible for giveaways just for being on the list. Thanks for watching, and we invite you to join us next week for another adventure right here on 906 Outdoors.